A substitute teacher, after forcing himself on a woman and revealing fantasies about kids, was fired from his job, but only temporarily, returning to work at a middle school only four months later. Then, this happened. When it comes to kids in school, we all hope that the kids are going to be safe. But time and time again, this isn't the case at all. While gun violence probably comes to your mind when I say that, there are a lot of other kinds of incidents that often get overshadowed or straight up buried, and this is one of them. This story started out in St. Louis, Missouri, when a woman named Maura Benson just barely turned 18 and started her senior year at Melville High School in August of 2019. Around this time, she grew tired of the single life and decided to try and find a boyfriend, turning to online dating apps in order to do so. This is when she came across a profile that caught her eye, that of a man named Brandon Holbrook. Brandon was first very vague about his age when talking with Mora, stating only that he was older than 19. Given that he was fairly young looking, she didn't imagine that it would be much more than that. However, after talking more and more, she came to find that he was 9 years older than her at the time, being 27. While Mora did wonder why he wasn't dating someone his own age, she unfortunately went down a bad path that a lot of high schoolers tend to go down, finding the concept of dating someone much older exciting. Brandon quickly took note of this and took full advantage of it. Given that she was now 18, nothing was really illegal about the arrangement, but given that she was still in high school, many people found the whole ordeal at least immoral. They started dating, mainly just light stuff like going out to the movies. After a while, Mora agreed to go to Brandon's house, and this is when things started to get much darker. He began making confessions to her, all leading up to one big confession. That confession being that he was honestly into girls younger than her. Much younger than her. The more the two were together, the more he would reveal about his fantasies, telling her that he would like her to help him roleplay that sort of thing. And then, he forced himself on her, telling her that making him feel good was supposed to make her feel good. And then Brandon would go on to present something to her that would send a shiver up her spine. An acceptance letter to work as a substitute teacher for the Melville School District. The exact same school district in which Mora was actively attending class. Mora didn't go to the police right then. She was traumatized. She didn't know what to do. She was still a high schooler at the time. In her own words, My body had just been violated. I didn't want to have to show it to a complete stranger or have to go through a rape kit. She proceeded to block Brandon from any and all social media as well as her phone, effectively removing him from her life as much as she possibly could. Brandon wouldn't stand for it though. Later on down the road, he started trying to add her on Snapchat, messaging her saying that she vandalized his car, something that she didn't do. More than likely, this was just a ploy to force her into conversation. Mora said, Going to his house would be very traumatic for me, so I would never even go there. I remember seeing his name and just feeling this pit of fear build up inside of me. Just like terror, because I never wanted to associate with this person ever again. This had stirred up all of the previous trauma she had. By this time, she was also in college, studying art education and working with one-year-old children during her childhood education classes. She came to realize how important it would be to report what Brandon had done. Even if she didn't want to go through with pressing charges herself, she needed to at least prevent him from doing the same thing to an even younger person at his new job. She said, The more I work with kids, the more I realize just how vulnerable they are and just how evil he was. Someone in that position has so much power. And to know that he had that position, even if it was just as a substitute, I knew he could take advantage of it. Mora began to Google how to report what had happened to her to the school district without revealing any of her own personal information. This was when she came across the state's Courage to Report system. She went on to report him, hoping that this would prevent him from working for the Melville School District. The St. Louis County Police got the tip on November 16th of 2021. A detective reached out and contacted Mora the very next day. The detective asked her what exactly her endgame was in reporting the incident, something she found very strange. She responded by simply saying that she didn't think he should work at a school. The police relayed to Mora that the school district had taken action and terminated Brandon's contract, adding that he would no longer be eligible to work for any school in the district. They weren't able to reveal any more information than that. They did urge Mora to report the incident to the St. Louis City Police rather than the St. Louis County Police, given that the assault had taken place at Brandon's home in the city. 
Believing that Brandon was no longer working with children and wanting to move on herself, she left it at that. She felt that she had effectively done her job and prevented him from hurting any more kids in the district. But she would soon come to face sheer disappointment. While Brandon Holbrook, now 30 years old, had indeed been fired from his substitute teaching job in November of 2021, this was a decision that was not going to last. With no explanation, Brandon got his job back at the exact same school district in April of 2022, only being unemployed for four months in total. He started working for various schools in the area, including Forder Elementary School. Yes, elementary school. Only one month later, Brandon would come to meet his next victim, a 14-year-old girl, while he was teaching a class at Bernard Middle School in Melville. Brandon began trying to groom this girl, even adding her on social media and talking to her there. It wasn't long before he was sending pictures as well. Then, by using the school's data, he was able to find her address. Once he did, he went over to her home and did exactly what one would expect. He forced himself on her as well. He did this not only once, but returned to the house two more times at other dates to do the same thing throughout summer break. The last time he would go to her home and do this would be on August 22nd, the first day of school. He threatened the girl with violence not to tell anyone about what had happened. The threats didn't work. The girl went on to report him to the school district, who immediately flew into damage control mode. As soon as they heard about it, they swiftly filed a report to both the Missouri Division of Children's Services and the police. The same day, they wiped Brandon from the school's roster of substitute teachers completely. It wasn't too long before the police were on Brandon's trail. The St. Louis County Prosecuting Attorney's Office issued multiple warrants for him. These were for three counts of second-degree statutory rape and six counts of second-degree statutory sodomy. In September, the police caught and arrested Brandon on those charges, reporting that they were particularly concerned because Brandon both knew the address of the victim and had repeatedly threatened her. Brandon Holbrook was thrown into jail, held on a $500,000 cash-only bond, a bond that he was, not surprisingly, unable to pay. The St. Louis County Police Department was pretty worried. Brandon had worked for this school district, of course, but he had possibly worked for even more. Given his history, it was very possible that he might have some other victims out there. Once more a Benson, Brandon's original victim, came across the headline, Former St. Louis County Substitute Teacher Charged With Sex Crimes, she didn't have to read the article to know who it was. She already knew, deep down, saying, I knew it, and that makes me sick to my stomach. The school district was very quick to deflect blame. They said that Brandon had went through an extensive background check before being hired and that they had no reason to worry. They said that he hadn't yet been working at the school district during the current school year, only the last, making him not one of their employees while he was arrested, technically. They also said that they aren't responsible for any assaults that take place off of school property or during the summer, saying that this made the victim not a student and Brandon not an employee. People didn't take too kindly to these claims, pointing out that the last assault took place on the first day of school, so even their own self-serving interpretation of the incident wasn't based on facts. And then, to make it all even worse, the school district went on to blame the victim, a 14-year-old girl whose substitute teacher looked through school records to find her address and came to her own home and forced himself on her. They said that she was at fault, saying that she, quote, unreasonably failed to take preventative or corrective opportunities preceded by defendants as to avoid harm. Mora was one of the first to point out how terrible this statement was, describing the situation as victim-blaming. Victim-blaming of a child, to add. She said, Knowing now that they allowed this to happen, despite what they knew, makes it even worse. And they're trying to blame this poor girl, despite the fact that they knew information and they were withholding it. And that just breaks my heart for her because victim blaming is a whole other type of trauma on top of the trauma that this horrible man has already given her. Prosecutors pointed out that Brandon took no time at all to find his victim right after coming off of his short suspension from work and that it didn't only occur once, but three times. The school district wasn't about to get off so easily. Brandon was thrown into jail, the St. Louis County Justice Center, on September 16th. He was put into quarantine in a cell on the 8th floor. This wasn't really because he was seen as a danger to himself or others, but simply because he was waiting on a negative COVID test, which was protocol at the time. It was just standard procedure before he was moved into the general population. While in there, Brandon went and met with a mental health caseworker who determined that he was fine, to the extent a guy like him can be. 
He was cleared to move into the general population, the regular living quarters of the jail, pretty soon. Brandon, however, wasn't super excited to meet the other inmates, knowing the kind of treatment he would likely receive due to the nature of the crimes he had committed. Then, only days later, Mora would come across yet another headline that would come to shock her. Man found dead in jail cell following accusations of statutory rape. Officers at the jail came to check on Brandon at around 3.15 on September 26th, reporting that he was fine. Then, upon checking on him 30 minutes later, they came to find him sitting straight up in his cell, using earphones, ignoring the officers. An officer requested that he stand up, but he didn't react. So this officer went into the cell and tapped him on the shoulder, still getting no reaction. He was unconscious. The officer attempted to revive Brandon with some CPR to no avail. He was given some Narcan just in case, which is a medication that can reverse the effects of an opioid overdose. Those types of drugs are unfortunately pretty common among the inmates, apparently. Medical staff showed up to the cell and also attempted CPR, as did paramedics, but he never regained consciousness. Brandon was pronounced dead about one hour later at Barnes Jewish Hospital. It was later found that he had died from a fentanyl overdose following all he had been charged with. As a result, he will never go on to face justice. The police were never able to determine the nature as to how he died. They knew the cause, but they didn't know if it was self-inflicted, a homicide, or just a simple accident. Scott Rosenblum, Brandon's attorney, finds the whole situation very suspicious, saying that he's looking forward to an independent investigation into Brandon's death. He added that he knew for a fact that Brandon had no intention to take his own life. He said that Brandon was not a drug user and that his family was going to conduct an independent autopsy. The attorney said, We had been speaking with him and he was very logical and he was cogent coherent and participating in his defense. Under the circumstances, he was optimistic and upbeat. He was still enjoying very close family ties. My client was planning to plead not guilty and we were planning to vigorously defend him against these allegations. Maura Benson felt some sort of relief upon hearing about Brandon's death, but was slightly conflicted. Maybe he won't face any substantial jail time, but he also won't be able to hurt anyone else anymore. She said, he can't hurt anyone else now, but part of me is angry because I feel like it's an easy way out, but I also feel like I don't know if he would have gotten the punishment he deserved. The family of Brandon's 14-year-old victim is taking the situation into their own hands. They have decided to sue the school district, pointing out that Brandon's continued employment was exactly what put their daughter at risk in the first place. He would have never had the chance to even meet her if he hadn't come back to school that April. The family's attorney, Grant Boyd, said, this is an exceptionally troubling case, and we look forward to pursuing justice for yet another child that was let down. In doing these cases on a nearly daily basis, I'm constantly finding myself surprised at the level at which people will go to jeopardize the safety of children. The school district refused to comment, saying that they can't because of the pending litigation. The superintendent did send a letter out to parents following Brandon's arrest, though. Mora and many others have rightfully been disgusted by the school district's reaction to the whole ordeal, with Mora saying that students shouldn't be forced to protect themselves in the place of the people whose job it is to protect them. To make matters even worse, the St. Louis County Police have revealed that two more young victims have come forward since Brandon was arrested. They are still in the middle of investigating these allegations, but even if they're able to collaborate them, the perpetrator is already dead. Maura Benson is now participating in a number of different advocacy and recovery organizations that help victims of sexual violence, such as the Sexual Health Advocacy Group at Webster University and Alive St. Louis. I still feel like I could have done more, but I am trying to forgive myself for that because I didn't do anything wrong, he did. <laughs> Once again, thank you for watching my video. I have no idea if YouTube is going to let me get away with this one. If you found the video interesting, please give it a like. It really does help out in the algorithm. And subscribe if you want to see more content like this. I do have social media, so you can follow me on there if you want. And I also have channel membership activated now if you want to give that a try. If you want to support the channel even more, I do have a Patreon account, which I always keep linked down in the description below. This has been your host Kyle, thank you, and good night.